This is One on One. There she is, Lauren Duca, journalist <laughs> and the author of How to Start a Revolution, Young People and the Future of American Politics. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, starting, wait, why, what's the revolution? Why do we need a revolution? Can't we just have a civil discourse about politics in this nation? Well, I, I think the revolution includes civil discourse. I think the revolution is about understanding that we all need to have an active role in our democracy and the ways in which we've been boxed out and alienated from understanding that are so extreme. We have this disconnect where we view democracy as sort of an abstract historical achievement and feel no right to be having any sort of political conversation whatsoever. No, you say we. Millennials? I think the average American, but what I've studied in my book and what I'm most interested in galvanizing is this shift that is occurring for millennials and Gen Z, where we're no longer passively navigating a broken system, but we're actively seeking to change it. And there's this idea that young people just don't care. Go ahead, play uh, that. That's, you just took the next question. The, so just don't say they do. Tell me about what. To, well, I, well, I would love to say that there's this idea that young people don't care, and it's stated as if it's a natural extension of low voter turnout statistics. The reality is we've always been quite passionate. If we can talk in generational, demographic scale, millennials and Gen Z tend to be very altruistic. We are passionate about social justice. We want to leave the world a better place than we found it. What's changing now is that we understand that we can take action in a traditional political sense. We feel qualified to run for office and start nonprofits, and at a lower level, to contact our elected officials, to make donations, to otherwise raise our voices and express political opinions. And that's changing, because before we were we our turn. So Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, she symbolized anything connected to what you just described? Because she, I believe, as we do this program, she's only 29 years of age. Yes. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a stunning example of this shift. And I think the most amazing thing about her is the way that she's reaching people. She's breaking down policy proposals right next to beauty advice on Instagram. And in that, you see what's really missing. So many politicians have make absolutely no effort to reach out to young people. You know, we're told that, that we don't care, but where's all the stock crap my generation cares about in the average political campaign? You know, it's not, at a superficial level, it's not hard to market to young people. Mm. Well, look at this junk that's next to the cash register at Urban Outfitters. Why is that not present? Why are we not talking to young people on Instagram, on Twitter, in, in with the kind of language we use. That, that stuff is not hard. There's just, there's an incentivization for incumbents to maintain the situations that got them elected. Status they make quo ain't gonna get it done. No effort so to expand the second. electorate. So hold on sorry for interrupting. I don't wanna turn this into a Tucker Carlson interview. Okay. <laughs> Google the interview from uh, December 2016 with two of you. Uh-huh. Not as civil as this is. No. You recently had, a, you wrote about gaslighting. Mm hmm and gaslighting America, if you will, and we'll put that term into context in just a second. But you also, right next to it, was there something about thigh-high boots? <laughs> uh, me, me, I mean, meaning, my producers are talking to me about that. So you have no problem uh -huh. talking about substantive, important, controversial, but very important political issues. But talking about culture and social issues and fashion. You don't, you don't have these barriers. Yes, and I don't think that they should exist. I think that the idea that pop culture and politics somehow have to be treated as if they're oil and vinegar is ridiculous. Mm. We all have to Are have... Are we serious or fun? See, anything. We can have serious and non-serious interests. You know, what is democracy? Democracy is interrogating the question of how we ought to live together, mm. and surely we have to be able to enjoy our lives while we're doing that. And the idea that there are certain interests, right, like thigh high boots or nail art or whatever the case may be that are disqualifying is totally absurd. And I think that the more you poke at it, the more you see it's all made up, right? Like what made golf so serious? Uh, don't you dare talk <laughs> about golf. <laughs> do you like my... golf? You seem like you probably do. <laughs> did, you, did you just say you seem like you probably like golf? A minute. I, I love golf. <laughs> and my question is, what was your first clue? Is it the aging middle age thing? That, well, here's what, is it? what it is. You look how you, the way that you, I like you. This is a good interview, right? But <laughs> what you, if you thought I sucked, would you tell me? Well, yes. Okay. And go I ahead. think that you I'm not present surprised. look the aesthetics of how you present are endless, automatically authoritative. If you walk into the room and you say, "I have an idea," people are going to listen. If I walk you into too. the room and Stop. say, "I have,"
have an idea? No, I'm constantly, that's what happened on Tucker Carlson. I was discussing my gaslighting interview, and he says to me, stick to the thigh-high boots. That meant stick to writing about fashion. He said that? I'm sorry, I should have looked at it before. Yeah. He literally said, that dismissive. Stick to the thigh-high boots. Stick to those silly, girly interests. And the thing is, who says, right? I think we have to challenge what kind of person is automatically given entry into the political conversation, because you should have entry, but so should I. Why couldn't we both we easily, comfortably, confidently be in the conversation? Because there are all of these bizarre secret rules so that, that make it the case so that the straight white man seems as if they are automatically qualified. And it's so much harder to peel back your right and your sense of permission and your sense of agency. So, so much of what I'm looking at in the shift that's happening is that there was this sort of abstract feeling of alienation. One PhD student said to me, I understood people could be going to town halls, but not that I should be doing that. Another college student said, it seems like politics is a thing important men do off in a room somewhere. And what we see all the time, the kinds of people we see having these conversations, the kinds of people we see as our politicians and our media gatekeepers more often look like you than they look like me. And that creates the situation in which we don't feel like we have a seat at the table and we just haven't been invited. What's changing now is we're building our own damn tables. I say Donald Trump and you say... Elizabeth Warren. Wait, but why do you have to be? I, <laughs> you go political right away. I mean, saying Donald Trump. To uh, here's me. why. No, here's why I'm saying. <laughs> in terms of how you see him mm. as a leader. Okay, <laughs> again, you have someone who you view as someone who you think should replace him. As we do this, there's a little impeachment thing going on. You may have heard about it. Uh, <laughs> it's in the fall of 2019. We're taping this. We'll see this after. Forget about the election for a uh -huh. second. Talk about him as a political figure in this nation. Not just who you'd like to replace him, but him. Okay, yeah, I didn't understand the word association. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Donald Trump is a mendacious moron who is completely unfit for office at a mental level, never mind the extensive corruption using this office to give himself power. I think the shift that's happening is not just about him. I like to say he's sort of like a CSI blacklight, you know? We can see all the gross white stuff, but it's been there all along. And what was so shocking about his election for me and so many of the young people I interviewed is that all and of your our- book, for your book. Yes, I'm sorry. For all of our, all of our political media gatekeepers told us that it was absolutely ridiculous. The thought of this man becoming president was not a possibility. I mean, never gonna happen. And then it became a possibility and we we're forced to question the endless authority of these figures and to say, hey, who makes the rules? How does this system actually work? And how can we stop accepting the complete inequity and moneyed interests that outweigh our voices as just the way A few seconds, are. 2020. All right, well, you've made it clear who you like, but what do you think that campaign will come down to for the voting group that you're particularly concerned about, millennials? I think that what I'm really excited about about the primary right now is it's emerged already as a conversation about ideas. We're looking at the inequality that defines American life, the way the wealth and power are contained, mm. constrained by the fewest richest people and corporations, and understanding how we can redistribute it back to the American people. So the other thing I would say is- Two seconds, go ahead. My political views are feminist and quite radical, but my book is for everyone. And my goal as a journalist is to increase public power. So I believe that people, no matter their views, as many people as we can get invested in the political conversation, actively voting, actively participating as citizens, the healthier democracy will be. Democracy is not a spectator sport. No. And you just proved it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome back <laughs> You okay? threw me off with the word, Kate. Stop. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I was like, we're on right, password. <laughs> we're still on the air. We're we'll still be right on back the air. after this. <laughs> one on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Northward Center, New Jersey Resources, the New Jersey Education Association, ADP, and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer, and by New Jersey Monthly. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.